This video is brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you wish to support the channel and allow me to dedicate more time to producing such videos, you can do so with a small monthly donation on patreon.com slash Balkan Odyssey. Being part of the diaspora of any nation is a very confusing and melancholic experience. Having moved to Germany from Bosnia and Herzegovina in my teenage years, I've had my fair share of trips and visits back to the homeland, just like pretty much everyone else who's left family and friends behind in the pursuit of a better life. I'm sure many people can relate with this experience of departing into uncertain, uncharted territory and can vividly recall the precariousness and anxiety they experienced either as parents or as children in this context. However, the story I wish to share today is not about the emotional toll or day-to-day -day struggles of people who were forced to emigrate, but rather a truly depressing sensation an observant traveler may experience in his journey from Germany to Bosnia and Herzegovina. A personal observation so striking that it lingered at the back of my mind for quite some time now and has compelled me to explore this phenomenon more closely. The observation itself is very simple. As you depart from Germany, drive through the Austrian Alps, enter the ex-Yugoslav region through Slovenia, then Croatia and ultimately Bosnia and Herzegovina, you get to witness a gradual deterioration of everything around you. Roads, infrastructure, buildings and even the nature itself. Everything starts looking abandoned, depressing and grey. What makes this particular case so perplexing is the fact that it's observable in just a few hours of driving, just under 300 kilometers of road, stretching across three countries that were once united into one. When you enter Austria, there really isn't that much of a noticeable difference. Optically, it's just a smaller extension of Germany, with highways like airport runways, with secure streets, bustling construction work at every corner, large stretches of cultivated farmland and well-maintained grass, Seemingly unreal houses in the countryside with goddamn private solar panels and other jaw-dropping things that for the average Slav look like a commercial come to life. Slovenia doesn't offer much of a shock value either, as it's defined by the same gorgeous alpine terrain and maybe slightly less impressive houses and buildings, but nonetheless functional, breathing and alive, at least optically and on the surface. The first really noticeable changes become apparent upon entering Croatia, driving past the country's capital Zagreb and descending down the highway in Slavonia towards the Bosnian border. Slowly but surely, the visibly patched roads become bumpier, the buildings, gas stations and houses are visibly older, some of them abandoned and burned during the war. However, the real tragedy starts becoming apparent in the area of what used to be the Serbian Krajina during the war, the region of Croatia that was once largely inhabited by Serbs, who were in the hundreds of thousands expelled from these lands they inhabited for centuries through the military operation of Oluja in 1995. This act of ethnic cleansing, seen and celebrated as a national victory for the now free, independent Croatia, hereby bears a deeply ironic quality. This tragic exodus of Serbs, seen as a liberating act that turned Croatia into one of the cleanest ethno-states in Europe, has left numerous villages and large swaths of land completely barren and abandoned, with houses burned to the ground, entire villages turned into ghost towns that eerily get swallowed by the surrounding forests as you drive by. As you enter Bosnia and Herzegovina, Cross the border and drive along one of the curvy country roads that leads to your hometown, the upcoming stretches of roads and villages won't fail to shock you no matter how often you come to visit. The bumpy and patched roads now become barely traversable, with holes big enough to destroy your tires if you don't take the obstacle course seriously enough. Deblina asfalta koja bi bilo poželjno da se nalazi u svim banjalučkim ulicama je 7 cm izgleda ovako. Međutim, postoji jedan asfalt koji u narodu poznat kao predizborni asfalt i on izgleda ovako i njegova debljina je svega par centimetara. E upravo, dragi ljudi, u ovoj razlici, u debljini asfalta se krije 
dodatna ekstra zarada svih građevinskih firmi, nadzornih organa, službenih lica koji u gradskoj upravi i svakdje dozvoljavaju da se ovakve ulice grade u Banja Luci i niču brže nego pečurke poslije kiše. Upravo se u jednoj predizbornoj ulici nalazimo koja je rađena prije svega deset dana. Evo molim vas ovdje da se približite na lice mjesta. Da vidite ko je ovo dozvolio. Pogledajte, ovo nije debljine. Ni 2-3 cm. Pogledajte šta radi asfalt u Banja Lučkim ulicama. Pogledajte. Ovo, evo ja ću ovo namjerno da uradim. Da pokažemo sav bezobrazluk. Pa nek mi pišu kazne. Pa nek pišu. Znači ja ruko mogu da kidam asfalt, dragi ljudi. Put rađen prije 15 dana i propao. Banja Luka, 21. vijek 2018. godina Karanovac. Mislio sam da će poslije onog videa predizborni asfalti više da se ne prave. A ko je radi ovaj put u Karanovcu? Pogledajte ljudi, opet kidamo rukama, a sad je jedan cenat, jedan cenat ljudi. Pogledajte ljudi, je li ovo normalno? Je li ovo normalno ljudi? Gledajte još gore nego ono, vidite ovo, molim vas. E sad pitam gradonačelnika, pitam načelnik, ko je ovo radio ljudi? Ko je ovo radio ljudi? Je li ovo normalno? Ko je ovo ljudi radio? Ste vi normalni? Along the road, the disturbing amount of the houses, shops and buildings you get to see are abandoned. Some of them burned to the ground, swallowed by trees and bushes, and filled with bullet holes from the war, with their owners either long dead, expelled, or far away in the diaspora. This, however, isn't the case only in the countryside. Most small towns are still filled with abandoned buildings and horrible roads, Unpatched facades, broken street lamps, random plastic bags and trash scattered over grassland, trash container areas turned into unregulated garbage dumps with a casual old man or lady diving into the container, looking for something to eat. Sada, čime se robiš sada? Skuplja, flaše, otpad i tako to. Otok živiš, prehranjuješ porod. Jeste, 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 otok živi, nas osapat. To je jedin, jest, živi od ovoga, a treba prehradujati nikakva druga primanja, osim socijalne otcove i invalidine s to sam, da se mara, kad to nam je sve. Here and there you can see some attempts to renovate, to build a new house or shop, but these efforts and meager investments are mostly contained exclusively to the town center, as a three-minute walk toward the suburbs will demonstrate. Along the stretches of sparsely inhabited suburbs, Every now and then you'll see a freshly built, ungodly expensive wannabe villa with brick walls, lion statues, stainless steel gates and balconies, but the blinds decisively shut, the gates closed and the driveways empty. Such luxurious houses are built by people who've, just like myself, left the country during and after the war to Western Europe, better known as Gastabaiteri who then throw their fortunes into thick, empty walls they get to visit once or twice a year. In between the holiday seasons, it isn't only the houses that lay vacant. During fall and winter, town streets lay completely empty, with only the occasional vagrant dog and old man or lady strolling down the city center. During holiday months, however, or Christmas, Easter and during the summer, these depressingly empty streets suddenly get filled by people like me who descend out to Bosnia to visit their families and comment how, year by year, everything is decaying and getting worse and worse, how once bustling and lively places have now become precarious ghost towns with no foreseeable return. Year in and year out, we all take that same route from the western promised land down to our pathetic periphery all silently asking the same question. Where did we go wrong? Spending most of your time in Germany or Austria, or any Western country, really gets you used to the well-maintained roads, the shiny building facades, the perpetual construction work and renovations, the efficient public transportation, and overall well-developed infrastructure. So those few times a year that you get to visit your hometown really do serve as a reality check, as a cold slap that serves as a reminder of the perpetually decaying society that you were lucky enough to escape. But sometimes, despite being infinitely thankful for the opportunity to escape the Vukoyabina, suddenly you get paralyzed by this wave of guilt, of anger and melancholy. 
You get angry at whatever allowed for such a tragic decay in the first place, that allowed the demolition of your country, the inhumane atrocities, the theft, corruption and nepotism that forced you to run as far as your legs can carry you. The forces responsible for this decay are often skewed, mystified and misrepresented by the powers that be for obvious reasons. Instead, represented as uncontrolled, isolated occurrences that have no deeper material significance. So it's really up to us, and us alone, to make sense of them and to demystify them. But at the end of the day, it just feels shitty that none of it is in your hands, and your only option was to bail out and take care of yourself and your family. You feel rather helpless, tied up, and forced to observe these devastating forces wreak havoc upon your homeland. To observe those same people you innately care for get sucked into this vortex, succumb to this corrupted mentality, and desperately partake in the rotten system because they have no other choice. Personally, this guilt and sense of helplessness tends to slap me even in my sleep, with one dream in particular that stood out to me as very disturbing. In the dream, I came back to my hometown in Bosnia after a long, long absence where I was simply busy with all of life's responsibilities back in Germany. I was on my bike, strolling along the usual route to my grandparents' house, when I noticed that everything was completely abandoned and taken over by nature in this post-apocalyptic setting. The roads were completely demolished with bushes and vines sprouting everywhere, making them barely traversable. My grandparents looked old, much older than they really are, just scraping by in this decaying behind land. So yeah, that's that. So, to understand the true nature of this phenomenon, we must investigate the inner, systemic root causes for these ailments and uncover the systemic forces that govern our societies on a macroeconomic level. The only way to successfully undergo such a task would be to engage with concepts from the political economy and then apply them to this practical example. The first step would be to expose the underlying disease that facilitates the rise of the symptoms described throughout this video. That disease being our global socioeconomic system capitalism, and one of its tentacles in particular, namely the ruthless force of imperialism. So, to make sense of their impact on the world, we must first take a look at the context, the wider picture that hosts these symptoms. Namely, we we'll live in a global socioeconomic system, where capital accumulation and the extraction of profit is the main motive of economic and societal development. Due to a plethora of geographical, geopolitical and circumstantial factors, capital formation and primitive accumulation have first appeared in the countries of Western Europe, who were, as already established, leading colonial powers at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. In the context of our anecdote from the beginning, Germany and Austria indeed fit this description. These countries have, due to their favorable conditions, had a disproportionate economic and political advantage over the rest of Europe and the world, including the Balkan Peninsula, already solidified through centuries of colonialism and old age imperialism, of the plundering and enslavement of Africa, Asia and the Americas, and then sealed with the advent of capitalism. With the steady emergence of capitalism out of the womb of feudalism in the 18th and 19th centuries, the ever-accelerating industrialization had demonstrated its tendency towards centralization and consolidation into fewer and fewer hands, manifested in the growth of enormous cartels, trusts and monopolies in the leading capitalist countries. Having conquered their respective domestic markets through a short period of ruthless competition, these monopolies and corporations have reached the ceiling in terms of potential growth they can achieve within their national borders their capitalism has become overripe and has reached a monopoly stage, so that it now had to transform, to conform with the inherent need of capital, to constantly grow and expand. This transformation, in a technical sense, meant the merger of bank capital and industrial capital into so-called finance capital. This finance capital was now to be exported to the world market, aka to the rest of the developing world, 
including the Balkans themselves, that house the very lucrative, cheap workforce and virtually free natural resources to be exploited. This very development, the concentration of capital, then creation of monopolies, the consequent export of surplus capital and the division of the world among the great powers, can be summed up and defined as imperialism, as the highest stage of capitalism. Herewith, the traditionally already subjugated regions of the world, that were impoverished and maldeveloped through centuries of colonialism, had then become victims of imperialism, that achieved its ends through violent military conquest, political destabilization and sabotage, installation of loyal right-wing puppet regimes, etc. This unequal power arrangement and bullying of the small by the big fish allowed for coercive trade and other deals that made sure that the net flow of value will be from the periphery to the center, that super profits will be extracted from the vast laboring masses of the subjugated global south to their masters in Western Europe and the USA. What is known as the Balkan Peninsula is often regarded as an inextricably complex and diverse part of the world, filled with dozens of artificial divisions, state borders, religions and local nationalisms. Despite economical logic, this culturally relatively similar region never managed to form a unified national market, like Germany and Italy did in the 19th century. The historical landmark of forming modern nation-states was postponed in the Balkans, as the region was stuck between the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires, two bastions of reaction that stalled all progress and revolutionary currents in the region. While Western Europe was consolidating obsolete feudal formations into enormous nation-states under the helm of the ever-growing bourgeoisie, Balkan peoples were busy fighting for freedom against their overlords. As the geopolitical struggle over the peninsula reached its apex, the stitches of the Ottoman aberration began to break one by one, as the subjugated peoples experienced national liberation after 400 years of slavery. This delayed struggle for the formation of viable nation-states was at the same time a shitshow of petty conquests and mini-imperialist conflicts where the voracious national bourgeoisie, under the patronage of big imperial powers, grabbed all the territories they could as the Ottomans were retreating from the Balkans. So, instead of resolving the national question and forming a united economic market that would stand a chance against external imperial powers, the grudging and petty mini-bourgeoisie of each nation decided to engage in fratricidal wars and conduct ethnic cleansing in the pursuit of artificially clean-cut borders that ought to restore some mythological old glory. Tsarist Russia enjoyed the role of the protector and patron of certain nations under the cloak of Slavic Brotherhood, seeking to protect its own geopolitical interests in the emerging chaos. Moreover, Austro-Hungarian policy came down to early predatory capitalist behavior against these petty toddlers, bureaucratic ruthlessness and dynastical intrigue that secured the hegemony of the Habsburg Empire that was presented as an enlightened cultural mission against Ottoman backwardness. In practice, the Habsburgs were consciously preventing the formation of an independent industrial base in the neighboring Balkan states. Favorable export tariffs and unequal exchange deals signed by the obedient local ruling classes ensured that these emerging economies would be infallibly tied to and dependent on the imperial core, as a semi-colonial mosaic of maldeveloped minions. As a consequence, the entire region participated in only about 2.5% of the entire industrial traffic of Europe, with its economic base entirely based in agriculture, which meant that 80% of its population was made of peasants, tied in feudal relations with kulaks. Precisely this century-long, multipolar, hegemonic pressure over the region was the spark that plunged Europe into the Great War in 1914 and sealed the fate of the Balkans as the underdeveloped underbelly of the continent, as the powder keg of Europe that has stuck decades behind the blossoming utopias in the West.
Over the decades, this initially brutal face of naked imperialism was slowly rebranded, transformed, washed and cloaked, so that there is no official law, no official doctrine or political relationship that would help you associate modern geopolitical arrangements with imperialism as Lenin defined it. The rise of Western social democracies, such as those in Germany and France, give off the impression as if that era of colonialism and super-exploitation is magically over, as if the great powers are now suddenly compassionate with the suffering masses of the East and the Global South, sending aid and nobly helping them introduce democracy. However, this deceptive flower talk couldn't be farther from the truth. Imperialism and neocolonialism are still alive and well, wreaking havoc upon the so-called third world, justified through euphemisms such as spreading democracy, broadening civil society, fighting terrorism, and ooh, toppling dictators. Nonetheless, with the same essence and same motives, the super-exploitation of the capitalist periphery for the benefit of the ruling elites of the imperial core, and the maintenance of the illusion of social democracy. So, with the big picture in mind and with a basic understanding of the forces of capitalism, we come one step closer to understanding the misery that is perfectly mirrored in the anecdote from the first part of the video. By applying the laws of this paradigm to the area of southeastern Europe, it becomes self-evident why there is such a tragic, depressing gradient of misery from Germany to Bosnia-Herzegovina and beyond. The annihilation of Yugoslavia, together with the rest of the Eastern Bloc, meant the reintegration of these former socialist republics into the global capitalist machine. The place dedicated for us in this global system wasn't at shoulder height alongside the apparent capitalist utopias of the West, but as their subjugated, colonized sources of cheap labor and natural resources, and targets for their self-interested capital investments. For more insights into how this transition was facilitated upon the collapse of Soviet-style socialism, take a look at my video about privatization, where I've examined the tragedy of Yugoslavia and the Eastern Bloc in greater detail. Nonetheless, the transitory nature of the quality of infrastructure and different standards of living, ranging from Germany, Austria, Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia, can be attributed to the immediate proximity of the given nation to the traditional imperial core. Slovenia, the most affluent of the ex-Yugoslav republics, has historically had stronger economic ties to the West and has reaped the benefits of its geographic location. The same goes for Croatia, which is geographically and economically right behind its neighbor, followed by Bosnia, which, together with Montenegro, Serbia, Albania and Macedonia, serves as a black hole of socio-economic decay, as third-class citizens of Europe. Conclusively, it can be said that the liberation from these very chains can only be achieved through anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist struggle in the exploited periphery, and not naive, symptomatic treatment of seemingly random occurrences. We will never be just like the Germans, as long as we are the ones rallying at borders to clean their toilets and construct their buildings. As long as we are passively allowing the drainage of our workforce, the exploitation of our resources and destruction of our environment by foreign corporations, we will remain the pathetic, undeveloped banana republics that we are, both divided and conquered. So, the time is ripe to get rid of this curse, and as one bearded man once said, we truly have nothing to lose but our chains.